Good morning. So we're just about ready to start. We're going to read um, in, in the format of a staged reading, which means that uh, there is minimal staging. We are not dealing with props. The actors won't be moving a great deal. The general uh, playing area will be up here. There is some action that takes place over here, which is why there are microphones set up. And uh, the stage directions will be, will be read by Juan over here. OK? Um, we're going to begin at the beginning of Act 2. And I think the scene probably runs about 25 minutes. All right? Uh, I th think that's all, that's all there is. We're ready to go. Good morning, thanks so much for coming today. My name is Susan Madeira. I'm from the Office of Academic Affairs and I'm running the Common Read here at Queensboro. Um, the Common Read means that we're all reading the same book at the same time. There are about 950 students at Queensboro reading To Kill a Mockingbird currently and 950 students in local high schools who are reading as well. Some of them will be attending uh, some of our, our events, so we look forward to that. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Megan Elias, who's here today from the History Department, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about the South and the history so that we can make those connections um, to the literature. And Professor Michael Cesarano and his class, who is so wonderful to be here with us today, and we, we thank you ahead of time, because we know you're going to be fantastic. Because this is a performance, I ask you to please be respectful. Everyone's got a phone. Please shut it off, put it on vibrate or silent. We really don't want to interrupt them when they're, they're in the middle of the production. Um, I'd like to invite you to attend the event that we have this afternoon during club hours. It's from 1.10 to 3 o'clock, and that's going to be in the Science Building, room 111. That's Boo Hoo, a conversation on Boo Radley and stigma in To Kill a Mockingbird. You could also follow our Facebook group. Uh, join, please be a member. It's To Kill a Mockingbird at QCC. I think we're good. Okay, we're going to start first um, with Dr. Megan Elias. She's going to give us a little bit of introduction to the time period, and then we're going to follow with Professor Cesarano's class in the production. And after that, we're going to have some Q&A. If anyone has questions, either of the actors or uh, either of our professors, we'd be glad to have your questions. Um, I'd also like to invite you next Wednesday the Queensboro production will take place. Actually, it's going to take place over the next week or so, but next Wednesday we have discount tickets. It's only $1 for you to see the production. And it's not by these students, it's by other students who have been rehearsing for weeks. It's a full stage presentation with props, scenery. It's going to be absolutely fantastic, and it's only $1. So after our event today, I do have some tickets with me. If you'd like to buy a ticket, uh, you can just come up to me. And is there any questions going in? Great, thank you so much, and we look forward to a fantastic event. Dr. Elias? Hi. Thanks, so I just wanna give a really brief uh, kind of background to what everybody in this scene would know going into that courtroom and what, the, um, what their perspective would be on the idea of justice, on whether Tom um, can get justice, and um, Atticus's uh, concept of his role in, in this search for justice. Um, just really briefly, you probably know that um, there was, uh, slavery was legal in America till 1865. It ended uh, in 1865, at least it became illegal in 1865, we should say. Um, and in the next couple of years, um, amendments were added to the U.S. Constitution, which is our foundation of our government and our laws, um, that, that um, uh, established the citizenship of everybody born in the United States and that gave black men and white men the right to vote. Before this, only white men had had the right to vote. Still, women didn't have it, which is something that's referred to in the text as well, I think. Um, so by, uh, by 1870, um, theoretically, um, Tom should be able to go into the courtroom and be treated just like a man, right? Just like anybody else. Um, but because this wasn't happening in the South, Further legislation was passed in 1875, which, um, uh, which supposed, was supposed to secure um, equal what they called equal accommodation in public, um, uh, in sort of in public life. So the right for all um, people to uh, serve on juries, to be part of the judicial process, to be part of that special process that's part of our legal system in which ordinary people get to help decide what happens to other ordinary people who've got caught up in the legal system. 
Um, and so this legislation was passed in 1875, the Civil Rights Act, but it wasn't enforced. And so um, for Tom and for his whole community, there are laws that don't apply to them. And so their sense of what justice is is going to be very different for people like the Finches, who, because they're white, can assume that the law serves them. So for, um, for Tom going into the courtroom, he's facing, he's, he's going in in a context of a long history in which um, African American men have been kept away from serving on juries. They have been prevented from registering to vote, which is one of the main ways that um, communities figure out who's eligible to serve on juries is by who's registered to vote. They're not on those records because every time um, a black man goes to try to register to vote, he's intimidated away from, from doing this. Um, basically, terrorism was used throughout the South to keep uh, black men out of the legal, um, <laughs> not out of the legal system, I should say, but out, uh, away from their legal rights. So um, when, when Tom enters the courtroom and when all of the people in the colored balcony walk into that courtroom, it's not a space for them. It, they have been led to understand through, um, through uh, you know, almost 100 years by now that, that justice is for white people and that they're there, right? So we have to realize that all of those people waiting in the balcony, they're there with no expectations and yet they still have hope. So they know that the history is against them but they still have hope that somehow justice will be found. So them even being there, I think, is a very power, powerful mm -hmm. statement. Um, and we should remember that, uh, um, uh, I'm blanking, oh, Harper Lee, sorry, blah. Harper Lee, I'm not a literature person, obviously. Um, Harper Lee is writing in the, um, she's writing, it's pu published in 1961, she's writing about the 30s, she's writing about 1936. In the time that she's writing about what would have been on everybody's mind, though she claimed it wasn't on hers, was the case of the Scottsboro Boys, who were a group of young black men who were um, convicted of having raped two white women, although the, one of the white women recanted, took away her testimony. Um, and they were convicted mostly by all white juries. So this was very much on the mind of the public in the 1930s, um, would have been on the mind of everybody in that room at the time, if that room had been real. And then Harper Lee is writing um, in, in beginning to, to think about this in the late 50s, on her mind, as she has, she has said, was the case of Emmett Till. Does anyone know about that case? Has it come up? It hasn't come up in SG 128 yet. This was the case of a young man who um, was visiting Mississippi and was brutally murdered for having spoken to a white woman, basically. Um, and that was very much on her mind. Uh, he, his killers were, um, were let go by an all-white jury, so this all-white jury could serve to convict innocent black men and to let guilty white men go. Um, so by the time that she's writing, it's been thir almost 30 years since the case of the Scottsboro Boys and nothing, it seems, has changed. But of course it's 1961, so it's on the brink of tremendous change. Um, and we could argue that we still haven't gotten where we need to get, that the change has not been completed yet. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to give for background and then we can let these guys tell the story and then talk more later. Is that Thanks. I just want to say for those of you have, who have come in late, can you please make sure that you sign the sign-in sheets that we have around the room? And if you're reading To Kill a Mockingbird in your class, please write your professor's name there. We will be sharing these sign-in sheets with your professor. Thank you. Revealed is the trial scene with everyone back in place after the short recess declared by Judge Taylor. Bob Ewell is in the witness stand. Mr. Gilmer stands near him waiting. Atticus sits at his table with Tom Robinson and the spectators are seated. As before, the jury is continued to be in the audience and when addressed it, the speaker speaks to the audience. I see we still have a few with us. Well, let's get on. Mr. Ewell, you will keep your testimony within the confines of the Christian English usage, if that's possible. Proceed, Mr. Gilmer. Where were we? We were... Mr. Uh, Yule, did you see the defendant having sexual intercourse with your daughter? Yes, I did. Thank you, sir. You said you were at the window? Yes, I Yes, sir. Did you have a clear view of the room? Yes, sir. What did you do when you saw the defendant? I ran around the house to get in, but he ran out the front door just ahead of me. I saw who he was, but I was too distracted about Mayella. 
to run after him. Mayella was in there sprawling, so I run in there. Then what did you do? I run for Hexate as quick as I could. I know who it was all right. Pass the house every day, live down yonder in that nigger nest. Judge, I've asked this county for 15 years to clean out that nest down yonder. They're dangerous to live around, besides devaluing my property. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Ewell. Just a minute, sir. Could I ask you a question or two? Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Ewell. Folks were sure doing a lot of running that night. Let's see. So you ran to the house, you ran to the window, you ran inside, you ran for Mr. Tate. Did you, during all this running, run for a doctor? Well, no need to. Didn't you think the nature of your daughter's injuries warranted medical attention? Never called a doctor in my life. If I would, it would have cost me $5. Is that all questions? Not quite. Mr. Yu, you heard the sheriff's testimony, didn't you? Yes. Do you agree with his description of Mayella's injuries? Her right eye blackened, she was beaten around the Yeah, leg. I hold everything with Tate. He said her right eye was blackened. I hold with Tate. Mr. Ewell, can you read and write? Objection. Can't see what the witness's literacy has to do with the case. Irrelevant and immaterial. Judge, if you'll allow the question, plus another one, you'll soon see. All right, but make sure we see Atticus. Overruled. Will you write your name and show us? I most positively will. How do you think I sign my relief checks? James, do you think Atticus knows what he's doing? Seems like he does. Why about the fact that you remember he said, never, never, never ask a question on cross-examination unless you already know the answer. Because you might get an answer that will wreck your case. Looks to me like he's going frog sticking without a light. Would you write your name for us? Clearly now, so the jury can see it. What's so interesting? He's left-handed. That's it. What's my being left-handed have to do with it? He's trying to take advantage of me. Chicken lawyers like Atticus take advantage of me all the time with their chicken ways. But it don't change what I saw. And I'll say it again. I saw that That's all, Mr. Yule. I think we've got him. Still count your chickens. Her right eye was blacky, so it had to be sold with left-handed. Maybe Tom Robbins is left-handed. Mayella Violet Yule. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please tell the jury in your own words what happened on the evening of November 21st. Where were you on thus that evening? On the porch. What were you doing on the porch? Just tell us what happened. You can do that, can't you? What are you scared of? Him. Don't want him doing me like he done Papa, making him out left-handed. How old are you? Nineteen and a half. I see. Well, Mr. Finch has no idea of scaring you. And if he did, I'm here to stop him. Now sit up straight and tell us what happened. Well, I was on the porch and he came along and you see there was this old shiffer robe in the yard Papa brought in to chop up for kindling. Papa told me to do it while he was off in the woods, but I wasn't feeling strong enough then, so he came by Who and I was he? That and yonder, Robinson. Then what happened? I said, come here, boy, and bust up this ship road for me. I got a nickel for you. So he came in the yard, and I went in the house to get him the nickel. And before I knew it, he was on me. He got me around the neck. I fought, but he hit me again and again. Go on. And he took advantage of me. Did you scream and fight back? Kicked and hollered loud as I could. Then what happened? Don't remember too good, but Papa come in the room and was hollering, who done it? Then I sort of fainted, and the next thing I knew, Mr. Tate was helping me over to the water bucket. You fought Robinson hard as you could, tooth I, and nail? I positively did. You're positive he took full advantage of you? I already told you he'd done what he was after. That's all for now, but stay here. I expect big bad Mr. Finch has some questions. State will not prejudice the witness against counsel for the defense. I won't try to scare you for a while. Not yet. Let's get acquainted. How old are you? Said I was 19. Said it to the judge yonder. You'll have to bear with me, Miss Yule. Miss Mayala, I can't remember as well as I used to. I might ask you things you've already said before, but you'll give me an answer, won't you? Good. Won't answer a word as long as you keep on mocking me. Ma'am? As long as you call me ma'am and say Miss Mayella, I don't have to take his sass. That's just Mr. Finch's way. We've done business in the courts for years, 
and Mr. Finch is always courteous. Atticus, let's get on. And let the record show that the witness has not been sassed. How many sisters and brothers do you have? Seven. You're the oldest? Yes. How long has your mother been dead? Don't know. Long time. How long did you go to school? Two year, three year, don't know. Miss Mayella, a 19 year old girl must have friends. Who are your friends? Friends? Don't you know anyone near your age? Boys, girls, just ordinary friends. You're making fun of me again, Mr. Finch. Do you love your father, Miss Mayella? Love him? What you mean? Is he good to you? Is he easy to get along with? He does horrible, except when... Except when... I said he does horrible. Except when he's drinking? When he's riled. Has he ever beaten you? My paws never touched a hair of my head. Or We've had a good visit, Miss Mayella. Now we better get to the case. You say you saw Tom Robinson to come chat with Papa. What was it? A chiffon robe, an old dresser. Was Tom Robinson well known to you? What do you mean? Did you know who he was, where he lived? I know who he was. He passed the house every day. Was this the first time you asked him inside the fence? Was this the first time? Yes, it was. Didn't you ever ask him to come inside before? I did not. I certainly did not. You never asked him to come inside to do odd jobs for you before? I might have. There were several niggers around. Can you remember any other occasions? No. All right, now to what happened. You said Tom Robinson had you around the neck. Is that right? Yes. You said he caught me and choked me and took advantage of me. Is that right? That's what I said. Do you remember him beating you about the face? You are sure enough he choked you. All this time you were fighting back, remember? You were kicking and hollering. Do you remember him beating you around the face? It's an easy question, Miss Mayall, so I'll try again. Do you remember him beating you about the face? No, I don't recollect if he hit me. I mean, yes, I do. He hit me. Was your last sentence your answer? Yes, he hit. I just don't remember. It all happened so quick. Don't you cry, young woman. Let her cry if she wants to, Dutch. We've got all the time in the world. Get me up here. Mock me, will you? I'll answer any questions you got. That's fine. There's only a few more. Will you identify the man who attacked you? I will. That's him right yonder. Tom, stand up. Miss Mayella, let Miss Mayella have a good look at you. Is this the man, Miss Mayella? Scout, Reverend, his left hand, he's crippled. Caught in a cotton gin when he was a boy. Tore all the muscles loose. Is this the man who attacked you? It most certainly is. How? I don't know how, but he did. I said it all happened so fast. I don't, I don't consider calmly. Objection, he's browbeating the witness. Oh, sit down, Loris. Miss Mayella, you testified the defendant choked and beat you. You didn't say he sneaked up behind you and knocked you out cold. Do you wish to reconsider any of your testimony? You want me to say something that didn't happen? No, ma'am, I want you to say something that did happen. I already told you. He hit you. He blackened your right eye with his left fist. With his right I ducked and it, it glanced. That's what it did. I ducked and it glanced off. You're a strong girl. Why didn't you run? I, I tried to, I, I tried to run. You were screaming all this time. I certainly was. And where were the other children? Why didn't they hear you? Why didn't your screams make them come running? Or didn't you scream until you saw your father in the window? Who are you screaming at? Are you screaming at your father or Tom Robinson? Is that it? Who beat you up? Tom Robinson or your father? Miss Mayella, what did your father really see in that window? Why don't you tell the truth, child? Didn't Bob you will beat you up? I, I got something to say. I got something to say, and then I ain't gonna say no more. That nigga Yonza took advantage of me, and if you find fancy gentlemen don't want to do nothing about it, then you're all yellow stinking cowards. Stinking cowards, a lot of you. Your fancy airs don't come to nothing. Your mammon and Miss May Ellery don't come to nothing, Mr. Finch. That's all. Sir, the state rests. So we try to wind this up this afternoon. How about it, Atticus? I think we can. How many witnesses you got? Just one. Well, call him. I call Tom Robinson. Tom rises and walks towards the witness chair. The court clerk holds out the Bible to him. Tom cannot put his crippled left hand on the Bible, so he touches it with his right. Sorry, sir. That's all right, Tom. 
Do you swear to evidence your body gives the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I swear. You're Tom Robinson, 25 years of age, married with three children, and you've been in trouble with the law once before. A 30-day sentence for disorderly conduct. What did that consist of? Got in a fight with another man. He tried to cut me, but it wasn't much. Not enough to hurt. You were both convicted? I had to serve because I couldn't pay the fine. That other fellow paid his. Were you acquainted with Miss Mayella Violet Ewell? Yes, sir. I had to pass her place going into the field every day. Who's deal? I work for Mr. Link Dees. You passed the Ewell for the place to get to work. Is there any other way to go? No, sir. None that I know of. Tom, did she ever speak to you? Why, yes, sir. I tip my hat when I go by one day, and she asked me to come inside the fence and bust up a shift room. When did she ask you to chop up the, the shipper rope? Mr. Finch, it was way last spring. After I broke it up, I reckon I, I said, I reckon I have to give you a nickel, won't I? And I said, no, ma'am, they ain't no charge. Then I went home. That was way over a year ago. Did you ever go on the place again? No, sir. Yes, sir. When? I went lots of times. Under what, under what circumstances? She called me in. Seemed like every time I passed by Yadna, she had something for me to do. Chopping, kindling, toting water for her. Were you paid for your services? No, sir. Not after she offered me the nickel the first time. But I was glad to do it. Mr. Yo didn't seem to help her none, and neither did the children. And I know she didn't have no nickels to spare. Where were the other children? They were always around, all over the place. Would Miss Mayella talk to you? Yes, sir, she talked to me. Did you ever, at any time, Go on the Yule property. Did you ever set foot on the Yule property without an express invitation from one of them? No, sir, Mr. Finch. I never did. I wouldn't do that, sir. Tom, what happened to you on the evening of November 21st? Mr. Finch, I was going home as usual that evening, and when I passed the Yule place, Miss Viella were on the porch, like she said she was, and it seemed real quiet-like, and I didn't quite know why. She called me, she called to me to come in there and help her a minute. Well, I went inside the fence and I looked for some kindling to work on. I didn't see none. And she says, nah, I got something for you to do inside the house. The old door is off its hinges. I said, you got a screwdriver, Miss Mayla? She said she had. Well, I went up the steps and she motioned for me to come inside. I went in and I looked at the door and I said, Miss Mayla, this door looks all right. Those hinges were all right. And she shut the door. <coughs> Mr. Finch, I was wondering why I was so quiet. Like, And it come to me that there weren't a child in the place, not one of them. I said, Miss Mayla, where are the children? Go on, Tom. I said, where are the children? And she laughed and sort of said, they all go to town to get ice cream, she says. Took me slap over the air to save seven nickels, but I've done it. They all go to town. Tom, what did you say then? I said something like, why Miss Mayella? That's mighty smart of you to treat her like. And she said, you think so? I don't think she understood what I was thinking. I meant it was smart of her to say like that and nice of her to treat them. I understand. Go on. I said, I best be going. I couldn't do nothing for her. And then she said, oh, yes, I could. And I asked her what she said. And I asked her what. And she says, step up on that chair yonder and get that box down on top of the shuffle rope. Not the same one you busted up last spring. No, sir. Another one. Most as tall as the room. So I done what she said, and I was just reaching when she grabbed me around the legs. Mr. Finch, she scared me so bad, I hopped down and turned the chair over. That was the only furniture disturbed in the room. <coughs> Mr. Finch, <coughs> when I left it, I said, I forgot. What happened after you turned the chair over? Tom, you sworn to tell the whole truth. What happened after that? When I got down off the chair, she sort of jumped at me. Violently? No, sir. She hugged me. She hugged me. She hugged me around the waist. <coughs> There's a growing mur murmur. Oh. Tom, what did she do then? She reached up and she kissed me on the side of the face. She said she never kissed a grown man before, and she might as well start with a nigger. She said, kiss me back, nigger. And I said, Miss Mayola, let me out of here. And I tried to run, but she got her back to the door, and I had to push her. I didn't want to harm her, Mr. Finch. And I said, let me pass. And just when I say it, 
Miss Steele yonder hollered through the window. What did he say? Something not fitting to say around the children. Tom, you must tell the jury what he said. He said, you goddamn whore, I'll kill you. Then what happened? I was running so fast, Mr. Finch, I didn't know what happened. Tom, did you attack Mayel Yule? I did not, sir. Did you harm her in any way? I did not. Did you resist her advances? Mr. Finch, I was trying to without being ugly mm -hmm. to her. I didn't want to be ugly. I didn't want to have to push her or nothing. Let's go back to Mr. Yule. Who was he talking to? He was talking to and looking at Miss Mayella. Then you ran. I sure did. Why did you run? I was scared, sir. Why were you scared? Mr. Finch, if you were a nigga like me, you would be scared too. I want the whole lot of you to know one thing right now. Tom Robinson worked for me for eight years, and I ain't had a speak of trouble out of him. Not a speak. That's enough, Link Dees. If you have anything to say, you can say it under oath and at the proper time. You to disregard the remarks from Link Dees. Go ahead, Mr. Gilmer. You were given 30 days for disorderly conduct, Robinson? Yes, sir. What did the nigga look like when you got through with him? He beat me, Mr. Gilmer. Yes, but you were convicted, weren't you? It's a misdemeanor and it's in the record, Judge. When this will answer that. <coughs> yes, sir, I got 30 days. You're pretty good at busting up shipper robes and kindling with one hand, aren't you? Yes, sir, I reckon so. Strong enough to choke the breath out of a woman? I've never done that, sir. But you're strong enough. I reckon so, sir. Had your eye on her for a long time, hadn't you, boy? No, sir, I never looked at her. Then you were mighty polite to do all that chopping and hauling for her, weren't you, boy? I was just trying to help her out, sir. That was mighty generous of you. Were you so, why were you so anxious to do that woman's chores? Well, it looked like she didn't have nobody to help her. With Mr. Yule and seven children on the place, boy? Well, like I said, it looked like she didn't have nobody to help her. You did all this chopping and work for sheer goodness, boy? Just try to help her. You're a mighty good fellow, it seems. Did all this for not one penny. Yes, sir. I felt right sorry for her. She seemed trying more than the rest of them. You felt sorry for her? You felt sorry for her? He felt sorry for her. Now, you went by the house, as usual, last November 21st, and she asked you to come in and bust up the shipper robe? No, sir. Do you deny you went by the house? No, sir. She says she asked you to bust up the shipper robe. Is that right? No, sir. It ain't. You say she's lying, boy? I don't say she's lying, Mr. Gilmer. I say she's mistaken in her mind. Tell me, boy, why did you run away? I was scared, sir. If you had a clear conscience, boy, why were you scared? Like I said before, it weren't safe for any nigga to be in a fix like that. But you weren't in a fix. You testified you were resisting her advances. Were you scared she might hurt a big buck like you? No, sir. I was scared I'd be in court, just like I am now. Scared you'd have to face up to what you did? No, sir. Scared that I'd have to face up for what I didn't do. You being impudent to me, boy? I didn't go to me. No more questions. You can step down, Mr. Robinson. What's the matter with you? I'm okay. The heat got you? Ain't you feeling good? Said I was okay. Then why'd you run out? It's just, I'm beginning to understand some things. Like my boo Radley says, shut up in his house. It's because he wants to stay inside. That don't make any sense. Maybe he found out the way people can get out of their way to despise each other. Why did Mr. Gil Gilmore have to do Tom Robinson that way? Why did he talk so hateful? Still, that's his job. But he didn't have to sneer and call him boy. That's just Mr. Gilmore's way. They do all the fitness that way. Most lawyers, I mean. Mr. Finch doesn't. He's not an example. Still, he's, well, the same in the courtroom as he is at his house. Or on the street. No, no. Might be better if Atticus was a little more. Don't you realize yet? Your father's not a run off the mill man. Most people are. What do you care about most people? Can you realize? If you got over your crying fit, I guess I can take you back in. Wasn't a crying fit. Just didn't like the way Mr. Gilmer. That's because you don't understand about the law. His speech to the jury, how long has it been at it? 
just finished going over the evidence in Scout. Did that we're Mr. gonna win. Gilmer? Nothing new, just the usual. Hush now. With the court's permission? Never saw him do that before. Me either. Gentlemen, this is not a difficult case. It requires no minute sifting of complicated facts. This case is as simple as black and white. The state has not produced one iota of evidence that Tom, the crime Rob, Tom Robinson is charged with ever took place. The state has instead relied upon the testimony of two witnesses. Witnesses whose testimony has not only been called into serious question through cross-examination, but has been flatly contradicted by the defendant. I have nothing but sympathy in my heart for the chief witness of the state, but my pity does not extend to her putting a man's life at stake. And this is what she has done. She's done it in an effort to get rid of her guilt. I say guilt because it was guilt that motivated her. She committed no crime, but she broke a rigid code of our society, a code so severe that whoever breaks it is hounded from our midst as unfit to live with. She's the victim of cruel poverty and ignorance, but she knew full well the enormity of her offense, and she persisted in it. She persisted, and her subsequent reaction is something every child has done. She tried to put the evidence of her offense away, out of sight. What was the evidence? Not a stolen toy to be hidden. The evidence that must be destroyed is Tom Robinson, a human being. Tom Robinson, a daily reminder of what she did. What did she do? She tempted a Negro. She did something that in our society is unacceptable. She is white and she tempted a Negro. Not an old uncle, but a strong young black man. No code mattered to her before she broke it, but it came crashing down on her afterwards. Her father saw what happened, and what did he do? There is circumstantial evidence to the effect that May Ella Yule was beaten savagely by someone who led exclusively with his left hand. Damn you! Then Mr. Yule swore out a warrant, no doubt signing it with his left hand, and Tom Robinson now sits before you, having taken the oath with the only good hand he possesses, his right. You tricking lying- Shut your mouth, sir, or you'll be fired for contempt. So a quiet, respectable Negro man who had the unmitigated temerity to feel sorry for a white woman is on trial for his life. He's had to put his word against his two white accusers. I need not remind you of their conduct here in court. Their cynical confidence that you will go along with them on the assumption, the evil assumption, that all Negroes lie, that all Negroes are basically immoral, an assumption one associates with minds of their caliber. However, you know the truth, and the truth is, some Negroes lie, and some Negro men are not to be trusted around women, white or black, and so with some white men. This is a truth that applies to the entire human race, to no particular race. In this year of grace, 1935, we're beginning to hear more and more references to Thomas Jefferson's phrase about all men being created equal. But we know that all men are not created equal, in the sense that some men are smarter than others. Some have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money. Some ladies make better cakes. And some people are born gifted beyond the normal scope. But there's one way in which all men are created equal. There's one human institution that makes the pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal to an Einstein. That institution, gentlemen, is a court of law. In our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe so firmly in the integrity of our courts and the jury system. That's no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. <coughs> But a court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. I'm confident that you gentlemen will review without passion the evidence you heard, come to a decision, and restore this defendant to his family. In the name of God, do your duty! Did he say something else as he was walking back? I think he said, 
the name of God, leave him. Look at yonder. It's, all, it's Calpurnia, isn't it? Yes, sir. Can I speak with Mr. Finch, please, sir? It hasn't got anything to do with, with the trial. Of course. What is it, Cal? Judge, she says my children are missing, haven't turned up since noon. Uh, could you do something to help me find them? Dear, dear Atticus, yonder. Jem, Scout, come down. Meet me outside. We won, haven't we, Atticus? Have you done your reading today for Miss Bob? You've been here all afternoon, haven't you? Oh, Atticus, please let us hear the verdict. Have you done your reading today? Not today, please, sir. We just want to tell stay. you what. You read for Mrs. Mrs. Dubois. Eat your summer, and then Cal can bring you back, sir. They've heard it all up till now. They might as well hear the rest. Suppose the jury comes back before. Probably will. They might be out and back in a minute. You think they'll quit them that fast? Go do your reading. Eat your supper. If the jury is still out when you get back, you can wait up there with Cal to get a verdict. Thank you, Cal. I should skin every one of you alive. The very idea of you children listening to all that, Mr. Jem, don't you know better than take your little sister to that trial? As for you, Mr. Dill, you watch out. Your aunt doesn't ship you back to Meridian, to Meridian first thing in the morning. You ought to be perfectly ashamed of yourselves. And see. So I think it'll be interesting for you to, to compare what you've read in class, what you've seen these actors do, uh, to what you see in the full production when you go and see it uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, I guess i to turn it over to well, you. To, I think uh, both of us, right, you want to ask the, I bet you want to ask the actors questions about how they made their choices. I, I definitely do. Okay. Um, I'll turn my chair <laughs> What are your questions at? Does anybody have any, any questions for the actors about their preparation process? Or for me, about the nature of justice? <laughs> hey, can I ask that? Tough crowd. Um, so, how did, you, how did you all get cast? Did you choose your parts? It was no. very random. It was. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We had actually four different casts, and this is an assignment, one of the, one of the major assignments that they have to do for the, for the class was to prepare a role in this scene. So for the first three weeks of the semester, we had, as they did this assignment, they, they, I don't know if they were aware of it, which is why Patricia says it was random, but they were sort of auditioning, and I was looking for not just uh, what people could do in the role, but people who, who knew how to work and were prepared. And, and, and the most prepared people are who you see today. One thing about uh, oral interpretation as opposed to acting that, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but uh, you see people playing roles that, that they ordinarily would not ever be cast to play uh, because of age, because of gender. I mean, we had, uh, there are more women in the class than men. There are more women and th there are not enough men to cast all the male roles. So. You see we had uh, a, a woman playing Tom, a woman playing Atticus and Gilmer, and uh, the idea in oral interpretation is that you just accept that as a convention. One other thing that, uh, that we, that I used this assignment to demonstrate to some of the students who, who are not uh, theater majors. This is a class that's usually a mix of theater majors and, and non-majors. Uh, the idea of how to break down a scene technically uh, in, in terms of 
uh, what are called French scenes. Uh, let, me, let me put my class on the spot. Is there anybody here who thinks they can describe what a French scene is? It's not a scene you do with your mouth open. I believe a French scene usually is starts with an en either a character entering or exiting the scene and again concludes with another entrance or exit. Right. That's right. So there, there, there is, you can hold your applause till the end. The, the, the scene we just did is a section of one large, huge scene that, uh, that goes on beyond where we stopped. In order to rehearse it properly, if a director is going to uh, make a rehearsal schedule and, and know which sections of the scene he wants to rehearse, uh, we broke that one scene into 12 different French scenes based on entrances and exits that uh, people made. E even though it's a big set and everybody is on stage for the scene, entrances and exits people made into the, the playing area. So uh, that enabled us to sort of break it down into manageable, rehearsable chunks. Um, so I use this assignment to demonstrate to them what the uh, French scene is. I have a few here if you, if you want to look at it, if you've never seen how it's broken down. In terms of technique, um, if, you're, if you have the problem of having to play a character that is older than you, younger than you, a different gender in oral interpretation, I think that uh, what I encouraged them to do was to uh, find what you have in common with the character and focus on that and push the, the, the obvious differences to the back burner in, in their mind. Uh, so Tom, I remember we were in a discussion and I suggested to Alicia, she should stand in a gender neutral position. Um, a couple of the women who were playing male parts, I think a few times I had to, during one of the classes where Angel here was actually reading Reverend Sykes. I had to keep telling her to uncross her legs and sit in a, in a, in a Reverend Sykes posture. Um, so I think if you adopt a gender neutral position, if you are a man playing a woman, it doesn't mean you have to speak in a girl's voice, but you may, you may have a different kind of breath support. It won't sound feminine, but it might be something that, that uh, uh, touches on and suggests the character. I think of when Anthony Hopkins played Nixon. I don't think if you looked at a picture of him, you would, you, I mean, it was, uh, uh, they, they did what they could with makeup, but I think a lot of his mannerisms suggest the character, and that's what, that's what we've tried to do. I have a question, Atticus, thank you for telling us about your experience, but I would like to ask the other actors, those of you who have read it before in high school, did doing this oral performance help you to look at things a little bit differently or see things differently than when you first read the book? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Mayella, I see you nodding. Can you grab the mic? Thank you. Um, I don't know, because I read this playback, I think when I was a sophomore in high school, so that was like three or four years ago. Um, but seeing, reading the character of Mayella, like, re, you know, like really helped me understand it better than when I first read it in the book. So I think the more that you read a script, the more you understand the character and the situation that's going on in the scene. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm sure there's some questions in the audience, especially from our history class in the back. Don't mean to point you out. Um, but can you maybe give us a little bit of insight into this period in, in history? Can you share a little bit with us, or do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't make me come back there with a the microphone. Athena? There's actually one piece, of, one piece of information that I came across that uh, I wanted to share. Probably Professor Jimenez, who's directing the, the full production, is well aware of this. Uh, but I, it was news to me that uh, you know, there's always, when you read a book or, or a, a play, you wonder who's the autobiographical character. And I wasn't too surprised to learn that the character of Scout is the, 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 the Harper Lee autobiographical character, even though the, the play adaptation is written by another writer. Um, 
the interesting thing to me anyway was that Harper Lee grew up with Truman Capote and the character of Dill is largely based on Truman Capote who is a very well known writer in, in uh, the 60s uh, I think it was his breakthrough piggyback on that and what, what we do know is that again they grew up as very good friends and they actually worked together when uh, Truman wrote in Cold Blood it was Harper Lee who helped him to do some of his investigation however once Harper Lee won the Pulitzer Prize Truman Capote just disconnected he just severed that relationship so these are the things we find out when we think about the authors we look about the you know look into the history of what was going on at that time. And um, I'm hoping Dr. Elias will talk to us a little bit more about the history of that period to make more sense of this. Um, as she said earlier, we still have issues like this going on today. But as you can tell by what was going on in that scene, it was obvious that Tom Robinson could not have committed this crime. And yet, I don't want to give away the ending of the story. So I guess you're going to have to read the text. So hold on. So does this, for the history class, does this remind you of any, anything that you've been working on lately? What, what period are you up to? 1890, oh, so perfect. Yeah, I want my, she wants me to get away from the feedback, sorry. Um, so 1890, so what's going on in 1890 that makes you think about this or that you think has, has something to do with the, this courtroom? Plessy versus Ferguson, exactly, right. So tell us how. <laughs> You don't know how. Somehow, somehow. Who wants to help him out? Nobody wants to help him? He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Red Ells. <laughs> help him out. Tell us about Plessy versus Ferguson. Well, we talked about this in class, uh, was it last week? Uh, the doctrine of separate but equal. Uh, how there were two different standards for whites and blacks, and separate but equal was a myth. Mm -hmm. As we see in the play, right. the court is supposed to be neutral, right. but it very obviously is not. Yeah, Atticus makes that wonderful speech about how the courtroom is the place where all men are created equal, and it, it's clear to everybody in that courtroom that that's not true, that you all will get the only thing, right, the only thing that society gives him is the privilege of, of whiteness, that that's, his, that's all he has left to him. Yeah, what else? I just wanted to make a comment regarding the casting right now, the time that was studying, women didn't have a voice in the speech. Didn't have? They didn't have a voice. Right. So I feel like the cast, the depiction of the women, the male character, I think that's kind of Yeah, it's powerful, isn't it, to see a woman playing Tom Robinson and a woman playing Atticus. But in fact, in the 1890s, and you're, if you're going to get to this, if you haven't already, probably, not that I want to tell him what should be in his curriculum, but um, you might talk about Ida B. Wells, who was the... Um, foremost um, campaigner against lynching, which was the you know the elimination of justice for African American men, and she was she was really active in the 1890s. Um, she was she and so her history is also the history that goes into that courtroom that people know that there there have been many attempts to legislate against lynching to get equal justice, and they're completely um, they're fruitless, right? So that Ida Wells all her work of chronicling lynching means nothing at that point. Yeah. Nicole, did you want to say something? I remember your name. <laughs> what else? What are the, do you guys have questions for them? Did you do a lot of background research for this? Or is it the, is the novel your background research? Uh, yeah, we read, you know, what we didn't read, we were supposed to read to help us interpret our characters a little better. So you, to read the whole thing to get, you read the whole thing to... But I understand the character, so when you're trying to act out, you would, you would do their mannerisms. Right. But not, not so much thinking about the context that they're living in. Like, that too. Okay. They, they each, each student had a, uh, I said there were four different casts, each student had a major role that they had to prepare, uh, the subtext and break into beats, and in addition, they had to uh, be ready to read two other smaller roles. So in that process, I, I think they all became fairly familiar with each of the roles. So this morning, I had to 
have two people step into, three people I think, step into roles that they didn't know they were going to be reading, you know, which is why I wanted them all to be uh, well versed in the scene. There were a couple of times where, uh, one, reading the, the stage directions, uh, had to make some, some quick decisions as to what the most essential stage directions were, uh, because it's, it's a fine line. If a, if a character is getting up and walking across the stage, and the stage direction says Atticus gets up and walks across the stage, there's no <laughs> need to read it. But there were some key essential uh, uh, elements. For example, um, when Bob Ewell was signing his name, when Tom Robinson stood up and he, and he exposed his, his left, left hand that was, that was uh, injured from, from an old injury. Um, so that, that was, uh, I, I think you did the best. There were a couple, couple of decisions I, I would question, but he did the best he could. How did you guys like the acting? <laughs> It's, it's early in the semester. They have more assignments. Don't applaud too much. Question in the back? Oh, Professor Dolan. Is that I wanted to say that, that uh, I've taught uh, To Kill a Mockingbird in my Comp 2 class, and I ask my students all the time to think about the author and why the author wrote the book. And for Harper Lee, the character of Atticus Finch was her father. Her father was a Southern lawyer who defended a black man and he lost the case, and he gave up his law practice as a result of it. He was so disgusted by Southern prejudice. And I just you know, I keep my, tell my students all the time, when somebody writes something, so much of their life is evident in the work. And that was the case with, with Harper Lee. Her father was Atticus Finch, so that's where she got the mile. One thing with that, that I always drive home to these students, uh, whether with a scene that we're doing or a, a poem that they have to interpret and, 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 and uh, become that persona, whoever uh, it is in the world of the piece, that probably nothing has ever been written that's just a random slice of life. There is some reason that a writer decided to depict this moment on this day, and if you're performing it, you have to figure out what you think that is. And the different interpretations come from me thinking that it was inspired by this set of circumstances and someone else reading the same piece having a different opinion. So. Um, uh, I think that uh, the biggest thing that, that I hope some of these guys get from this first assignment and carry into the next assignments are, are that uh, when you have to figure out what's the persona, what's the locus, wh what's going on in the piece, um, it's not an acceptable response to, as the interpreter saying, to, to say, well, I'm not sure because the poem doesn't, doesn't indicate. It could be anything. You know, the idea, well, it could be anything, so you tell me what it is. We're now, we're now just applauding when someone arrives at the end of a sentence. I want to thank, thank our actors, and now you can applaud, really. You're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I want to thank our videographer, Alex, and, and the people from the ACC. I want to thank our faculty members here, Dr. Elias. Woo! Chelsea. Professor Cesarano. And Kona. Now watch the cut. I want to thank the audience. Yeah, there's, there's Starbucks downstairs if you need to wake up before you go to class. Seem to be a little bit sleepy. I want to thank you all for coming today. I want to thank you for, for reading the text. Some of you, again, for the second or maybe third time. I've read it several times myself. And each time I learned something else about the author. I learned something else about the text. I learned something else about myself. Um, I hope that you come to the other events that we have planned in the next three weeks. And again, I do have tickets for sale for a dollar for next week's matinee. So please come and buy a ticket. If you can't buy one today, you can buy one at the box office. Those are our professional actors. So thank you so much for coming today. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Shout out to Athena. And shout out to Athena. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kill the likes. <laughs> thank you.